Hello and welcome to Trading Places Unit 4 Part 2. In this video we'll continue looking at the end of the road and in doing so we'll ask this essential question. How did the Islamic empires differ with respect to their reactions toward western influence? As we saw in Part 1, the Mughals were increasingly weakened initially by Hindus within India and as foreign influence increased, several Nawabs succumbed to the British in order to maintain positions of power fragmenting the Mughal Empire even further. But ultimately, the Mughals were overtaken completely by the British, who prized the Indian subcontinent more than any other colony, due somewhat to its rich resources, but much more because of its market. That is, the millions of people in India who could purchase British-made goods. Another empire that became fragmented and westernized was the Ottoman Empire. Now, Suleiman the Magnificent was the Ottoman Empire's greatest leader, presiding over the apex of their military, political, and economic power. He is often referred to as Suleiman the Lawgiver because he personally instituted legislative changes relating to society, education, taxation, and law. His death in 1566 marked the beginning of a long decline in power for the Ottomans. Now, a century earlier, the Ottomans had won a key victory over the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople. But as European traders increasingly bypassed the Muslim-dominated land routes, the Ottoman income from trade and taxes declined. Unwilling to accept this loss of income in the 1500s, the Ottomans competed vigorously against Portugal for Indian Ocean trade. But by the beginning of the 1600s, England and the Dutch of Holland had pushed both the Portuguese and the Ottomans aside. These images show the Suleimani Mosque built for Suleiman the Magnificent in the mid-1500s. They also showed the wonderful architecture and technological advancement the Ottomans had attained. Now, as long as the Ottomans expanded, they were able to plunder and reap great benefits from the conquered lands. They even expanded into southern Europe and were on the doorstep of some of the greatest powers in the world at that time, the Europeans. However, toward the end of the 1600s, they were defeated at Vienna by a multinational coalition of European states. This was the farthest the Ottomans would ever get, and from that point on, they experienced less wealth, more revolts, and eventually, more loss of their land. Into the 1700s, they began to be referred to as the sick man of Europe because of their loss of land and power. As a multinational state, they found it too difficult and too expensive to rule absolutely. So, as the Mughals had done, they granted many leaders sovereignty over their own lands while remaining part of the Ottoman Empire. By the 1800s, the Ottomans had adopted many Western influences in weaponry, clothing, even technology. Even though they were weakened, they stabilized going into the 1800s. They may have been sick, but they were far from dead. An Islamic empire that took the opposite direction of westernizing were the Safavids of Persia. Now, Shah Abbas I ruled from 1587 to 1629 and he reconstituted a strong Persian state as a rival to the neighboring Ottoman Empire. From his capital at Isfahan, he presided over a golden age of commerce, refinement, and reform. Shah Abbas promoted the Shia form of Islam. Although he worked to make Persia more of a nation-state, he resided over a multinational empire. Nonetheless, his reign marked the height of Safavid Persia's success. His successors worked to centralize their power rather than to empower regional leaders. This, however, led to more corruption and inefficiency. Also, as more trade was diverted away from the Silk Road, the Safavids saw their wealth and power diverted as well. In the early 1700s, they lost Isfahan to the Afghans and land to the Russians and Ottomans. By the mid-1700s, the Safavids were completely conquered. The Qahar dynasty that took power in the late 1700s began to turn Persia into more of a theocracy, a government that was increasingly controlled, in this case, by the Shia leaders, as opposed to the secular leaders. Persia was not the only region that sought a more strict adherence to Islam, as opposed to the more western-leaning regions of the Ottomans and the Mughals. In Arabia in the 1740s, a young religious scholar named Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab concluded that all Islamic states, and specifically the Ottoman Empire, had strayed from the path of strict observance of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. In doing so, they had incurred the wrath of Allah. Only by returning to this strict observance 
could Islam triumph over the unbelievers? Now, Wahhabism is a very fundamental branch of Islam in which the followers adhere to many strict interpretations of their holy book, the Quran. The teachings of al-Wahhab, troubling to many Muslims, made him an outcast in Arabia until 1744 when he forged an alliance with the house of the Amir ibn Saud, who immediately established a small central Arabian state on Wahhabist principles. In time, they gained territory and possession of two of the most holy sites in the Islamic faith, Mecca and Medina. Funky Cole Medina.